Right. Well, um, welcome everybody to the um, final session of uh, today's part of the conference. Um, I'm Dunstan Spate. I'm the librarian of Lincoln's Inn and I'm also treasurer of the Rare Books and Special Collections group. Um, we have two presentations um, in this session and uh, for the first of these sessions I'm um, really delighted to welcome um, Gerard Carruthers who is the Francis Hutchison Professor of Scottish Literature and he's going to talk about um, authentication advances in the archives for Robert Burns manuscripts. Um, and he is um, superbly qualified to do this as he is the co-director of the uh, Centre for Robert Burns Studies and also uh, the general editor of the OUP edition of the works of um, Robert Burns. So, um, Gerard, over to you. Thank you very much, Dunstan. Um, I will just attempt to share my slides. I hope people are seeing those. So I'm going to share with you a little a process that has gone some way down the road in terms of interdisciplinary research um, with polyomics or chemistry at the University of Glasgow and the University of Edinburgh. Um, with the Centre for Robert Burns Studies at the University of Glasgow. And as Dunstan has indicated, this is in the context of the multi-volume edition of the Works of Robert Burns for OUP, for which I'm general editor. And of course, one of the obvious things uh, when you're doing any edition is you have to work on textual provenance. Um, you have to trace the, um, the various pathways through which text, both print and manuscript, have reached us. And in most editions of any major and many minor writers, there is always some dubiety over authorship of at least a certain body of texts. Um, in the case of Robert Burns, uh, we don't have manuscripts for about 8%, roughly, of the poems and songs. But I'm going to be speaking a wee bit about forgery, and forgery isn't a problem in the case of that 8%. None of the forgers, historically, that Burns had, at least five forgers, were bright enough to know that there was 8% where we didn't have manuscripts, and that might have provided an opportunity for fabricating a manuscript not otherwise in existence. Uh, much more problematic, in fact, is the textual provenance of um, works that relate to print objects, uh, much more of a problem than the case of, 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 of manuscripts. Um, and I want to, before coming to manuscripts, say a wee bit about the kind of issues that we have in terms of print provenance. In 2004, I discovered in an obscure-ish London periodical, some lines, um, an epigram, uh, from the 1790s, suggesting that there were no snakes in Ireland because nature had poured all the venom instead into Edmund Burke, very much a hate figure for the radical left in the 1790s. Since the 1930s, this had been attributed to Robert Burns, um, largely because it was found in a manuscript book in someone else's hand. Uh, and this manuscript book said that these were works, a series of epigrams that were either written or admired by Burns. Even that book didn't claim that Burns was the author on the epigram of Burke, Ellen Burke. Um, so um, I published a piece on this in Studies in Scottish Literature, suggesting that Burns was very unlikely to be the author given this radical London publication for various reasons. One, Burns would have been bonkers to go anywhere near that at the time he was employed by the British government as a, a, in the excise service. Um, and secondly, it was sort of unlikely that, that Burns at this point would turn up in a London periodical that was so far to the left. He did publish elsewhere in, in London, the periodicals, but this the, the circumstances here were very unlikely. Um, I'm this... sorry to interrupt just a second, but we're not seeing your slides. Oh, right. Right, why is that? I'm wondering. Um, right, okay, um, 
share screen. Are you seeing these now? Uh, yes, but you're not yet in presentation mode. Right, okay. Um, okay. Uh, right, I need to get rid of that, sorry. Um, I've got the bar at the top, so I need to move that and go to slideshow. Uh, so you haven't seen any of those? No. Apologies, okay. All right. So, can you see them now in full screen? Yep, that's working. Great. Okay, so there's the multi-volume edition to which I referred. This is the context in which we're thinking about uh, textual provenance. There is the epigram on work. We don't need to spend all that much time on it. Um, hopefully I've said enough to tell you what's going on there. I decanonized this effectively. This was, a po um, this was a story that The Sun got a hold of and then um, published a story under the very memorable headline, Bard's Boy Rabbi Nicks a Poem. Um, and I wasn't suggesting that Burns had stolen the poem so, um, or plagiarised, simply that it had been misattributed. Uh, one of the things that's happened more recently, I published another article on this, um, some 15, uh, 16 years later, and the point about the new article that I've published is almost certainly the author is identified as a man called John Williams, who wrote under the satirical pen name of Anthony Pasquin in the 18th century. And the reason that I raise that point is there's a wider point I want to make here about the digital archive. Part of what enabled me to identify John Williams as the author and take this research further from 2004 to the present is that I was able to find six other printings in six separate periodicals in London and Dublin. The simple point is that the digital archive becomes ever bigger. It's much easier to do this kind of provenance research in a way that wasn't the case even 10 years ago. Um, before I get to manuscripts again, another um, print um, example. Burns's first book, Poems Chiefly in the Scottish Dialect, known as the Kilmarnock Edition, because that's the town in which it was published in July 1786. There were 612 copies published. Today, there remain something like 84 copies, and they fetch anywhere between 30 and 80,000 pounds. No surprise then that over the past century, there have been um, facsimile renditions of Burns' Kilmarnock edition, which have attempted to dupe the market and which some unwary collectors have bought. Um, four or five years ago, a census of Burns' Kilmarnock edition by Alan Young and Patrick Scott has come out. And that's been a very useful tool because what that does is that it tracks all the bona fide 80 plus um, copies which remain. And that kind of useful information um, in that book, which struggles to contain it, we really need it now in digital forum because um, there's so much information. These are the kind of tools that are very much helping us with provenance. So we've got this pr print context, we've got forgery in the case of um, print items. And we also have, in general, one of my bad jokes, we've got a myth eaten corpus. We've got a Burns corpus that is often very polluted in many ways, because um, there are, are at least over 70 Masonic poems that are attributed to Burns that he had nothing to do with, over 100 politically radical poems that he had nothing to do with. And we've even, in the 1850s, got poems attributed to Burns coming via seance rooms, in Yorkshire, there are over a dozen of these, and they don't take an awful lot of time to dismiss, but the Masonic, the political, and some of the other poems are more difficult to deal with. Now, these are not forged manuscripts. These are texts that um, are there, and which over time become part of the afterlife. They're attributed to Burns. They're confused with Burns. They're often impersonation. They're often honest mistakes. In some cases, also, they are willful attempts to intrude new poems into the Burns canon. This has been going on since at least the 1840s, when there was frankly a market for editors paying for new material, either biographical or textual. And then we have the very special problem of Burns's forgers. I calculate there are probably five forgers, uh, but more work needs done on this. And most notoriously, 
we have Alexander Antique Howland Smith. And there's a picture of the dapper gentleman there who in the 1890s goes to jail for forging burns. He not only forges burns, he forges Mary Queen of Scots, Queen Victoria, Thackeray, Trollope, Dickens, Keats, Byron, Shelley, Walter Scott. He forges versions of that historic document, the Solemn League and Covenant. And he produces a lot of Burns material. Depending on how you count them, there are about 12,000 Burns manuscripts and there are around 1,500 forgeries. I've no idea really how that compares to other writers. I don't think we've really done the work collating or comparing um, what might be going on here in terms of uh, forged authors. That is something we might want to think about in the future. Very briefly, Antique Smith's story. In December 1892, he's arrested uh, because suddenly there is a glut of new Burns manuscripts on the market. On at least three occasions, he forges all of Burns's greatest hits, somewhere between 70 and 100 poems, and the authorities become suspicious. There is an investigation, and in June 1893, um, he is put on trial before the Lord Justice Clerk in Scotland, one of the most senior legal figures. That's how seriously we take crimes against the bar. And there are 170 productions, uh, documents, uh, most of these uh, forgeries associated, associated with Smith, and there are 47 witnesses. Poor old Smith only has two defence witnesses, one of whom is his sister and the other is his sister's lodger. Um, Smith probably produces over 600 Burns forgeries and almost certainly he wasn't acting alone. The prosecution argues that he had acted alone and um, Various Edinburgh booksellers are produced to say that they had been duped. In fact, there's a rather seedy story where even after um, the whole thing was exposed, these booksellers still made money. Um, a bit of the story that remains to be told is the way in which these booksellers were perhaps ordering uh, material from Smith, quite consciously knowing that these were forgeries. If you want to know more about that story, on our website at the University of Glasgow, there's a docu, um, a drama documentary co-written by myself. I also um, write and perform the theme tune, which makes me sound like Dennis Waterman. I hope that's not too off-putting. But the story of Smith is quite fascinating and we'll return to Smith presently to show you some of the developments we've made because Smith has been the prime cause of us looking to develop tools to detect Smith forgeries. Um, there's a small example of his handwriting, which is not a bad impression of Robert Burns, but it is too slanted. It's just a bit too slanted more than is normally the case with Robert Burns manuscripts. I can, and I've tested this, or collectors have tested me, there are one or two collectors who test Antique Smith and Robert Burns. I can almost always um, identify Burns and Smith, I can tell the difference. And I'm not entirely clear in my own head how my um, my perception is instantly picking that up. Maybe it's just that you, you get so used to looking at the two. Um, and I need to analyze this a bit more, even separately from the telltale signs that shows Smith. And I'll come back to what these um, signs uh, are. Because we've done a lot of authentication work on Burns and Smith at the University of Glasgow. Um, Smith, as I've mentioned, is very prolific. In the 1890s, there is that glut of his forgeries on the market. These occur again, especially in the 1930s, and they crop up every now and again. And because they had resurfaced on the market, many of these forgeries in the 1930s, the great American burn scholar J.D. Lancey Ferguson began to um, set out the rules for identifying antique Smith's forgeries. And there were a number of things that, that uh, De Lancey Ferguson pointed out. One of these was that Burns's handwriting goes through four distinct 
changes, three changes, four phases, and Smith didn't understand this. So, for instance, um, Smith, uh, sorry, Burns early on will loop his D, and later in his career, he more often than not does a straight back D. And uh, Smith didn't understand this, so he would actually produce uh, purported Burns manuscripts from the later period that contained imitations of Burns's earlier hand. And uh, there are 30 or 40 features that we have picked out, taking on uh, Delancey Ferguson's observations and advancing these. Um, so with the naked eye, there is a lot you can do. And again, just a couple of wee examples, uh, to don't spend too much time on this. One of the telltale signs when Smith is doing a Robert Burns signature, he will have an underscore line that is continuous, that is even, because he applies the same pressure. Burns was almost always, when he was doing an underscore, doing it much more casually, and therefore the ink would trail out. And you see this time and again, it's one of the telltale signs about Smith. He doesn't understand that the underscore line is uneven. We've got some other things, such as the fact that um, we've got two Robert Burns genuine signatures on the left here, and two antique Smiths on the, 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 the right. And one of the features is the, the um, Burns's um, R uh, tends to have a flourish that goes up above the eyelet, whereas Smith tends not to do that. I know this is getting very anarchy. And also Burns's eyelets are closer together generally in ascending and descending strokes. Um, all of these things we can kind of spot the difference between Burns and Smith, because although Smith's handwriting looks quite similar to Burns, there are many subtle differences that he simply doesn't get. And talking of being an anorak, what we've begun to do is to isolate letters. We've got a Robert Burns alphabet and an antique Smith alphabet. And we go through the four phases of Burns's handwriting. We include not only letters, but numbers um, and other things such as underscores. And we're, we're just at the beginning of setting that database up. And I'm hopeful in future, perhaps even, that working with colleagues in uh, information science and computing, we might even be able to do something with the sizes, but we haven't quite developed that yet. One of the other tools that we've been using is a paper database where uh, Dr. Ronnie Young at the University of Glasgow has led on this. This was an idea I saw relating to Shelley in Oxford. I saw this idea in general and thought we'll nick that for, for Burns. So we've been building up a paper database and one of the crucial things that Smith doesn't get right is the fold in Burns's letters and poems. So we've got a database of folds. Another fairly obvious thing, we take images using um, light boxes so that that kind of information is immediately there as um, a source of comparison. Our paper database isn't as yet public facing, but it will be in due course. And I would suggest it's, it's you know, this is Ronnie Young's excellent work. This would be a good model for other um, writers and other corpora. Um, we have a number of fields of, um, we get some general description uh, for the manuscripts in that database, where especially we register previous physical damage, which often helps with the provenance trail. Obvious things like size, chain lines, measurements, um, orientation, um, and so on, um, watermarks, countermarks, and we've got a lot of information on production sites of the paper that Burns uses. And what we did was we decided that we would, um, we would have JPEGs um, for the images that we took and also the raw images for digital image manipulation. So there are two sets of, um, of imagery going on to make it, it usable. Um, that has been a very good tool. Um, we've got obviously a search facility for it. And again, a point I would want to make, we'll work closely with a number of libraries. We don't have an absolutely exhaustive set of all the types of paper and 
material that Burns used. But with a number of Scottish partners, we've got a good sample size, which could, of course, be expanded out further. We could take in, and I hope to in future, the British Library, the Huntington, the Bodleian, etc. So this is uh, one of the tools that we've been using in terms of authentication. We have often been, consult been consulted by auction houses um, and dealers um, and when they're dubious about uh, Burns items that come up for sale. Um, so this is obviously a useful tool. Um, there's a British Academy volume forthcoming where we're publishing a lot more um, about this in detail in a book which some of you may know about, uh, materialities of the digital archive that the British Academy are bringing out. It's Irene Gurudali and Andrew Prescott who are co-editors of that. And then the other um, item below is I never ever thought that I would co-author a piece in a scientific journal, specifically scientific reports. And this relates to work that we've also been doing on mass spectrometry, which I can barely say, let alone understand. But this has been an exciting breakthrough. Uh, working with polyomics at the University of Glasgow, specifically with Dr. Carol Burgess, now at the University of Edinburgh, we decided that um, we would do some work with a PhD student, now completed his PhD, on um, testing authenticity in Burns and Antique Smith. Uh, we did things like um, procure recipes for 18th century ink um, to, to, to experiment with the, the material. And we also um, tested, because these days you can do it with next to no destruction, which is fairly crucial, of manuscripts. We tested Burns and, Man and um, Antique Smith. And what was interesting was that um, signatures, chemical, the chemical constituents producing peaks under mass spectrometry were something that could be produced for Burns and for Antique Smith so that we have distinctly different um, a, graphs, uh, tables with distinctly different chemical uh, peaks. Um, Antique Smith would do the schoolboy thing of using tobacco and, old tea, and tea to age his manuscripts, sometimes complicated because Smith would procure actual 18th century excise, excise paper or uh, leaves from 18th century books. So in a sense, there was an attempt to, to, to throw people off the trail, but the mass spectrometry technique really identifies the, the ink uh, that is very distinct between Burns and uh, Smith. Smith was able, because he was quite a good draftsman, quite a good artist, um, to mimic the kind of orangey brown that we find um, in the ink in most cases, in Robert Burns' case, but he didn't know mass spectrometry. He didn't really know the, um, the, the constituent parts of the ink. And what my scientist colleagues have been able to do is to produce tables that can show us fairly clear difference between Burns and Smith. On to another thing that I barely understand. Uh, they also put the, the Y axis here is um, basically uh, masses, weights of molecules, and the pictures that they build up, they tell me, and here we've got Smith's ink, Smith's paper, Burns' ink, Burns' paper, they, they, they end up with results that show something that, that uh, very clearly differentiates. Um, apparently they use something called a support vector machine to do this. Um, and uh, this is something that we are continuing to develop, they're continuing to develop, and in various ways, hopefully it will have um, applications beyond Robert Burns. Um, forgery from the 1840s, as I think I've suggested already, we've got this polluted record. And the real problem with some forgeries um, that we've got in the printed record, as late as 1968, James Kinsley, a rather fine Burns editor, as late as 1968, we'd get forgeries being collated in editions of Burns with genuine manuscripts and other materials. So that's the stuff um, that, that, that's kind of in there and that we're trying to, to undo. 
Um, I want to give you an example, a wee example of the kind of cultural problem that we face with Robert Burns. Um, there was a note that surfaced in the last uh, 10 years, the so-called Highland Lassie note. And this relates to Burns' song, The Highland Lassie, which is about one of his lovers, who um, around whom there's a lot of and may were apart, perhaps going off to the West Indies together. Hi there, sorry, I don't know what happened. At what point did I um, lose connection? You're muted, Dunson. Uh, it was just as you were talking about the Highland Lassie note. All right. Um, and you mentioned that it uh, concerned one of his lovers, at which point you froze. And I, I, I think there might have been some, uh, some censorship involved. <laughs> OK, sorry about that, folks. So the Highland Lassie note um, is the, the one where um, the lady from Australia suggested that I should be sacked because it was a forgery, because Highland Mary didn't exist, so the note couldn't exist as authentically from Burns' pen. It turned out later that she claimed that she was descended from Burns' wife, um, Jean Armour, and so didn't want to hear about the other woman. She, like everyone else these days, is a conspiracy theorist. And the fact is that the knowledge of Antique Smith, the actual forger, allowed her to claim that this was an Antique Smith forgery. In fact, it wasn't. When you test the chain lines, all the other features that we know from our paper database, and indeed the penmanship, and indeed when it's repatriated in the Scots Musical Museum, which we did, it can be found to be entirely authentic. And it's one of the texts we're now waiting to, to, to sample the ink. Although I know already, I can bet, I can bet my mortgage, it's going to be proved to be genuine. And just a final example, the only manuscript we have of Address to the Onku Good, one of Burns' uh, religious poems, one of his Kirk satires, this was owned by a collector who became, who came to believe that it was an antique Smith forgery because rather improbably it's, it appears on the, the boards of a religious manual, which seemed almost too good to be true. It's um, satirical about religion. Uh, this was seen to be too neat by the collector eventually, or he bought it as genuine to begin with. And the other thing that he believed was that there were signs of antique Smith, because under relatively low magnification, you can see signs of antique Smith because his strokes will break up because he used a steel nib, which Burns never did. And under, again, fairly uh, relatively low magnification, you can see that Burns's penmanship is almost uh, certainly smooth. In fact, although this looks a bit like an antique smith, it's genuine. And the reason that the, 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 the penmanship is a bit less smoothly continuous it's simply because of the material, the boards of the pamphlet of the book on which it's written. Um, and again, we're able now to say that that, in fact, is um, authentic. But it's the mass spectrometry that's able, my science colleagues warn me that, you know, you can get false positives, you never to be definitive. I'm sure they're right. But with fairly high degree of certainty now, we can show where Burns's ink where Burns' uh, penmanship, et cetera, et cetera, these things come together to authenticate. So we're much more secure than ever we've been, but nonetheless, this coming Thursday, I'm going to a repository that has some material in it that is perhaps a bit dubious. There's a huge amount of antique Smith still out there, given what I've indicated about his uh, production. And this is an ongoing um, task that we have as we edit the poems. And it's a wee bit daft because one of the points I made at the outset was this isn't actually a huge problem for the edition. It's a minor problem affecting a very small number of texts, but it's one of the most interesting things that we've become involved in. And uh, there is clear applicability here um, for other writers, as I've mentioned. Documents. Oh, so that's just to give you a glimpse of where we've been with this. 
My apologies about uh, the connection going down. I hope that made some kind of sense in terms of the research. In um, right, so um, I think we're probably just going to have to uh, wait for the, the next instalment um, when um, uh, Jerry manages to, to make the connection again. Um, in the meantime, of course, you've had the diversion of a, a police siren outside my window, so uh, I hope you enjoyed Oh, Gerald's back. Uh, and you're muted. And um, oh, the other thing, um, sorry, um, when you, uh, uh, when the connection went, your slides went as well. So would you mind um, uh, resharing those? Right, I'll try and do that. Sorry about this. I've, I've oh, right, host disabled, but I can't share. You need to allow me to share again, I think. Oh, hang on. Oh, you're here. You're back again. Yeah, sorry about this. I, I, I don't have a clue what's going on, Dunson. I'm afraid. Sorry about this. <laughs> Right, so, um, uh, oh, gone again, oh no, you're still there. Um, mm -hmm. Right, so um, at, at, at this point, um, are you sort of ready for questions now, or? Um, and you can um, move very quickly because you've got other things to do, I, 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 I get so, that. So, so Bob had a question which um, he asked to um, the, the uh, uh, empty uh, while you were um, uh, absent. Hi, so uh, can we have, have the question again, Bob? Hi, hi, Jerry. Sorry, you're having a difficult, uh, difficult one with the technology. Um, it was just really to ask you, you, you made an allusion to applications beyond burns for the mass spectrometry. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. What sorts of wider applications or applications with other maybe uh, 18th century inks or, or for other authors are you, you envisaging might be possible here? Well, give it, um, I, I suppose I meant it very simply, Bob, given that uh, Smith did uh, the Solemn League and Covenant uh, twice, it would be interesting to do mass spec on the, the real Solemn League and Covenant and his forgeries to produce, uh, you know, that kind of thing there. I suppose all I mean really is that there are other writers who have been forged, often by Smith himself, but, but you know, not alone in that, where um, we, we could do stuff in this. One of the one of the distinctions is obviously ink often down to the 19th century at least is often specially mixed by particular writers um, as opposed to the mass produced material and so some work could be could be done on that. At the moment we're preparing a large scale HRC authenticity bid that attempts to go beyond Burns and to 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 look at a number of writers and apply these these, these techniques. Um, and needless to say that technically I know next to nothing about the science behind these, so I'll be relying on colleagues in polyomics and elsewhere to advance that work. But some of the kind of cultural history underpinning that is obviously something we'd be inputting where the bodies are buried, but it's the other colleagues to, to do the actual uh, autopsies, if you like. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask um, ab about um, Antique Smith? I mean, obviously, um, he's, his uh, activities have been known about for a, for a very long time, been studied, and obviously far more information is available now. Um, there, there is, a, a, in the art world as well, a sort of very select band of forgers mm -hmm. who are sort of so notorious um, that they kind of uh, have a, a life of their own. Um, is there a sort of certain value attached to one of his forgeries simply because it's his or is, is, are there yes. just too many of them? Um, his his uh, forgeries now will go for some hundreds as compared to the some thousands that a Burns manuscript will, will go for. I know of at least two collectors who collect both Burns and Antique Smith. And there is something that certain collectors see in Smith that they kind of identify with, because although Smith um, was producing for the market, he didn't make much money himself. And he was interviewed shortly before his death in 1913. He was interviewed by uh, someone for the Burns Chronicle, and it was quite clear that Smith took 
a kind of pride in his work. He's someone I think who today we would be be seeing as kind of on the spectrum, whatever exactly that that means. Um, Smith, um, someone who is a cultural phenomenon in himself, and you know, it's so many aspects of the afterlife of Robert Burns worth exploring because he tells us something about Burns, the desirability um, of Burns and, 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 and Burns uh, manuscripts. I'll, I, what we need is, and I don't want to do this, I hope there might be someone out there who'd be keen to do this, we need a new biography of Antique Smith um, because it would be a very interesting case study in a whole series of, in a whole range of cultural phenomena. And was it the um, Burns forgeries that led to him being discovered, or was it one of the other literary fakes that nailed him? It was largely the Burns material, Dunstan, for a start. He had um, very often he would he would copy known Burns texts, but on one or two occasions he would fabricate letters, particularly in one instance from a weaver in an Ayrshire village, and that Ayrshire village, even 120 years later, could definitively say. That guy uh, to whom the letter is written doesn't exist, never existed. So there were some naive things that, that Smith did that, uh, you know, had him banked to rights. And then after that, the whole thing unraveled. Uh, a lot of booksellers turned evidence. They said, we didn't know what was going on, even though Smith was coming in saying, here's 100 uh, Burns manuscripts. I'm an impoverished uh, legal clerk. Where did you get them? Oh, I found them in a bin round the back of the building. Oh, that's great. Let's have them. More questions should have been asked. So I feel a wee bit sorry for Smith. Although he was sent to jail, the judge clearly also had a bit of sympathy for him because he was allowed not to have hard labour, as was the custom in those days, um, added on to his, his, his tariff. And... Um... If uh, a, a sort of new manuscript appeared that was uh, hitherto unknown, I mean, possibly even um, uh, an unpublished poem or something, what would, would you think now be the sort of bare minimum of these various techniques that you've been discussing, which, which would any sort of dealer should now be um, doing as sort of standard to authenticate it? Well, I do think that um, the the chemical peak signatures of the ink and the paper are, are really the, 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 the standard here now. That, I mean, they're not really available except privately through my colleagues, but those are the things that would do it. The truth is, of course, that circumstantially, we can almost always uh, smell a rat if a rat is to be smelt in terms of provenance. But there is a, a small number of cases where dubiety remains. And really what I hope is that, you know, the, 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 mass, spec, the mass spec really now does it. And um, Jane, I think you've got a question. Do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask that? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jerry. That was really interesting. Um, I suppose I'm just interested tying in with some of the other things we've heard today around how we get all this data together and how it can be used. And you mentioned the paper database there. And I wonder if you'd had any interest from other people around using that paper database that isn't available yet, but will be, or if you've got any ideas of ways in which it could be used in the future. Well, th thanks, Ian. That's a very good question because um, although, as I mentioned, it's not yet public facing, part of the purpose of that tool was that it was developed in the context of Burns Scotland, which I was the chair of until recently, and that was museums, libraries, archives um, in Scotland, quite a number of these, and local authorities of Burns collections. So internally, they've been using that paper database to, to compare new acquisitions when stuff comes on the market, even sometimes, even just, you know, the, the, the web description or the web image provide, provided by sellers and dealers sometimes is enough to give us a start in terms of how credible that looks. More often than not these days, people do not suspect forgery. And in most cases, material on the market isn't forged. Although I heard of a case three years ago in America where people were convinced that they had a Burns manuscript that was clearly um, not the case and they wanted to sell it. So only very occasionally does that kind of thing crop up. 
the, the wider uses of the paper database, actually, in terms of watermarks, in terms of paper, actually, we could do a new biography of Robert Burns based on how much money he had to buy better or lesser materials at any point. I mean, again, that is that is something I don't think I want to do at any point. That's just, that's beyond even my level of anorakness. But there are, you know, there are things beyond forgery that you can do with the database, including piecing together um, previously collected groups of manuscripts. And also it can, it can solve issues of dating. We haven't done a lot on that already, but one of the things we're doing is four volumes of Burns' correspondence, the volume one and two to go to the press next year, and there are still at least a dozen letters where there are significant questions of data, and what we plan to do in future is to look at these, uh, the manuscripts, and that might well at least give us some reasonable clues towards reasonable dating. Well, um, sadly, we're running out of uh, time for this session. Um, Jerry, that's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and um, not least because I think it's shown any of us who might have been tempted to do a few Burns forgeries, just how difficult it is. So um, you've probably uh, uh, saved us quite a lot of fruitless attempts, but that has been absolutely fascinating. Um, and thank you very much indeed. Pleasure, thank you. Our next uh, presentation uh, is going to look at special collections teaching with AR and VR, the post-pandemic reality. And we have two speakers, both from the University of Manchester Library, uh, Jane Gallagher, who's the head of digital special collections and services, um, and who also uh, sits on the uh, Rare Books and Special Collections Group Committee and is a co-editor of our newsletter. And uh, she is going to be joined by her colleague, Padma Inala, who is the teaching and learning librarian um, at the University Library. Um, so um, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for asking us to come and speak today. And we're really gratified that you're, you're sticking around right to the end of the day, because I know it's been quite a long day and quite busy. Um, just to say, in order to save people's bandwidth, uh, once we've said hello, we're probably going to turn our cameras off um, just so that you don't have to worry about um, extra bandwidth coming through. But we are still here, honestly, and this is recorded. Yes. So, <laughs> as I say, thank you very much for, for inviting us to speak today. Um, as Dunst mentioned, we're from the University of Manchester Library. I'm Jane, and as you can see, this is my colleague Padma. Hi, <laughs> nice to be um, here. <laughs> so, let me just go on to the next slide. So just to give you a bit of a sense of um, what we put together. So uh, the third person involved who couldn't be here today is um, Carleen Barton, who is e-learning technologist um, at the University of Manchester working in the library. So today we're going to tell you about our experiences of developing augmented reality and virtual reality in teaching with special collections at the university. It began with a project we started in 2018 as part of our postgraduate certificate in higher education. So we're going to look back at the project we originally researched and developed, share some of the experiences that we have from that project and conclude with the implications for today's learners, along with the challenges that the pandemic has highlighted. Our learning experience and the final output of the project were both enriched by combining our different expertise across three areas. This is special collections, teaching and learning and digital learning. Collaborating really allowed us to draw on complementary skills and challenge our own individual perspectives. So this is the uh, title of the original presentation, which we gave way back in November 2019 at DCDC. As you can imagine, a lot has changed since then. Uh, when we first showed this project, we just completed it, it as a pilot. We were hoping to embark in some uh, exciting and inspiring developments with the technology to help us improve teaching and learning for our remote students particularly. So we proposed to design and create a session to teach students how to think critically when using special collections, using source analysis to improve their information literacy skills. Little did we know that by the end of March 2020, online learning, distance learning and the remote audience landscape would change so dramatically. Okay, so as Jane mentioned, um, our original project was based on an assessment for our PG Cert module called Teaching with Tech, and that tasked us with using technologies to address a learning challenge. 
So we identified the challenge of engaging remote audiences when using special collections to develop those th critical thinking skills, as Jane mentioned. So our project used virtual reality technologies to try to overcome some of the barriers that existed when accessing primary sources for teaching and learning. We were also interested in how we could also use a variety of other technologies, such as video, digital materials and blogs, all to contribute to the students' development of critical thinking skills and the development of their digital literacy. So despite the value of using special collections in teaching in a higher education library, there were numerous barriers to their use in, in teaching even before the pandemic, such as the fragility of collections, handling skills, different manuscripts and languages that needed to be under, to understand the original text. So at Manchester, many of our special collection materials are kept at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library, and it's a 30 minute walk from the main campus. So this sort of adds an extra barrier uh, when the materials can't easily be moved. So these physical barriers are further increased by psychological or confidence issues to access in special collections, including special rules and access requirements to use the material. People often feel a bit, you know, a bit scared, um, you know, in using them. So students carrying, uh, students studying off campus face many of these, these same issues, but also have additional barriers uh, that prevent that equity of experience and engagement compared to on-site students. And this is what we wanted to try to address really. So these include things like isolation, uh, which can lead to a limited engagement with fellow students and therefore limited interaction, limited forms of peer support, all of which we feel are vital to learning. Distance learning students in particular are often studying via this mode out of necessity rather than of choice. Um, they often have multiple commit commitments such as work and family. So the timing and the time available to study is also a challenge. Um, so teaching to remote audiences means that non-verbal cues and communication can be difficult. I'm sure many of us have found this over the last year and a half when we've sort of had to be forced into doing this. So there's often a reduced amount of interaction with both teacher and peers, all of which can ultimately lead to pedagogical challenges. Um, some of you may have experienced this um, recently as well. So because access to special collections is necessarily limited for off-site learners, there are bigger challenges around teaching approaches when compared with our on-site students. So for our project, we propose that the use of technology such as virtual reality and augmented reality could perhaps reduce a number of these bar barriers to teaching with the collections and provide distance learning students with a real world experience of access to the primary sources. So combining AR and VR with other technologies could offer even a wider opportunity for students learning. So for example, helping to create a, a neutral space for all students, not just those um, studying off, off site, incorporating different technology to encourage the use of new pedagogy, such as digital pedagogy. And students also get to experience different technologies, some of which could be used to combat things like that isolation, that lack of interaction, and help with support mechanisms, for example, like synchronous, um, synchronous in-session discussions and tasks. So all of our teaching is underpinned by pedagogy and obviously this case looking at teaching uh, with technology was no different. So just to give you a bit of an insight into um, our thought processes through the pedagogy as part of this project. So student centre learning is really key to our approach and the Scarlet project which you might have heard of used AR to enhance students interactions with physical special collections items by providing them with supporting content around that physical item looking to combine technological and pedagogical solutions. The discussions of teaching with uh, virtual reality often follow constructivist models of learning, whereby knowledge is developed by subjective experiences with feedback from others. Experiential and social aspects of VR learning have supported this, but more recently some have argued that emotional and engagement aspects of VR are just as important to ensure learning happens. There's also the element of cognitive dissonance. So we looked at this through Munnerly, who suggests that access to different perspectives enables learning. This has been explored in educational VR games to offer multiple viewpoints to students. So for example, seeing visuals or hearing discussions. And finally, um, Fowler argued that teaching design using VR should not be technology driven and proposed the conceptualization, construction and dialogue model, whereby students are introduced to the concepts, construct their own learning and engage in dialogue with others to experience cognitive dissonance and reframe their own ideas. The virtual sessions which we designed follows this model identifying concepts of primary sources with the learners, 
enabling them to explore these concepts and construct their own ideas in the VR simulation, then engage in dialogue with their peers to discuss their findings. Further, Burton and Cowling also discovered that the portable nature of VR learning, potentially on a mobile, for example, was beneficial for students. Distance or off-campus off learners could also take advantage of these tools, learning at their own convenience with appropriate technology. So as part of our original project in 2018, we considered three different VR applications using Bates sections model as a framework for assessing technologies in the classroom. So the analysis model considers a number of factors, including the skills and the needs of students, the costs, obviously, we all have to take that into consideration, and the teaching functions, and also the security aspects of using any digital tool in teaching. So the applications we considered at that time were engaged by VR education, Altspace VR, and Google Expeditions. In the end, we chose Google Expeditions since it supported many of our key criteria, such as removing the need to be on site and removing barriers to access as it was an open resource. We also had the ability to add our own environments and objects in expeditions and provide access to the experience through a headset, smart device or a tablet, and with the potential to make the session openly accessible online. So not behind a firewall or anything like that. We also wanted to be able to use this in combination with other learning technologies used at Manchester, such as Blackboard, which is our VLE, and Manchester Digital, Co Digital Collections, which was our new resource for exploring the high quality images of the cultural collections and research projects at the University of Manchester. So now we sort of introduced you to a little bit of the background to the project and how we got to that, that thought, got to that um, that point, we're going to tell you a little bit about the teaching session in more detail, um, starting with what we hope the students would get from it and the intended out learning outcomes. So the session is designed to help distance learning students engage with special collections using digital, digitised material curated in a virtual John Rylands library. So by using a scaffolded learning model that Jane has explained, the teaching will introduce and support students through concepts and context before engaging them in elements of independent research. It also helps to build learners' skills and knowledge of using new technologies when accessing these primary sources. So the learning objectives for the session were to, uh, sorry, included building the students' confidence to overcome psychological and physical barriers that we mentioned and gaining knowledge of how to access special collections, the ability to handle special collections objects appropriately, um, and developing the critical analysis skills and self-directed learning through the selection and evaluation of conflicting information from primary sources. Some of this will become clearer um, as we go through and we'll, 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 uh, we'll show you a bit of a video and, and an extra, uh, extra um, and the extra slides. So we introduced the session to the students in the VLE and enable initial introductions and outline the objectives. We then go straight into exploring source analysis by presenting the students with a virtual source, which is in Manchester Digital Collections, and getting them to list the questions they have about the source. For example, what is it? When is it from? Why was it made? This can be done individually or as part of a group with space for discussion on the VLE to list and compare questions. This section concludes with an instructor-led element listing possible questions and why it's important to know about the source you're looking at. This is then followed by a video, video which demonstrates how to handle the different types of materials uh, that the students will encounter in the digital form. A formative quiz uh, will check the students have understood this before they're able to move on into the critical thinking exercise. So we'll go into more detail about the critical thinking exercise shortly, but this builds on the primary source analysis exercise, encouraging students to think about questions for each item and then exploring the answers. We conclude in the VLE again, outlining the who, what, where, when and how questions, which are vital to considering historical sources and essential for looking at modern resources too. We then recap the learning objectives and ask the students to reflect on their learning using Padlet, which will help them to inform future sessions. So we're just going to um, give you a bit of a show of what we're actually doing. We're, we're talking about the VR elements of the session. So hoping this video works, which is, is the first test. So the first thing that the students do in the space to kind of acclimatise themselves is arrive in the historic reading room of the John Violins um, Institute and Library. And if you haven't been there in person, then I definitely recommend coming up to visit because it is as lovely as it looks. So this introductory room is a 360 degree image. It's intended to help students become familiar with expeditions, the software we're using, so they can navigate, find their way around the room and understand the software a bit more. 
The first scene also set the context um, with students getting the sense of the history and grandeur of the building, as well as the collections within it. The room itself has some interesting points the students can explore. So for example, uh, if I just get to the right point, you can see here we have the statue of um, Enriqueta, John Ryland's wife, who actually um, paid for the library to be built and was instrumental in um, the collecting. And then we have, for example, the stained glass windows at the end with a bit of information about them. So the main section of the, v, um, the VR activity is the critical thinking exercise, which we'll now demonstrate. For this exercise, we chose to focus on the topic of Peterloo, an event which sparked conflicting narratives. The Rylands also curated an exhibition in 2019 to mark the 200th anniversary of the events. So it was a very opportune time to develop the resource. And you can see here the um, publicity for that exhibition. So, Having familiarised themselves with the tool in the um, historic reading room that you can see here, the students then click through from this introductory space into a 360 degree image of the Rylands Gallery in which the Peterloo exhibition was installed at the time. They can now look around a bit more and acclimatise themselves. So for those of you who don't know, Peterloo took place in Manchester in 1819 when a crowd of peaceful protesters were violently, violently dispersed by the military on the orders of magistrates who feared social unrest. The students are tasked with investigating the primary source materials available, then answering the question, according to the sources you've explored, do you think the events of Peterloo were a massacre or a riot? So as I mentioned, this is a 360 degree photo and it does have some limitations. So you can't move around it as dynamically as say you could something like Google Maps um, and you can't really see the full captions or, or everything that's in the exhibition. But you can get a sense of the space and some of the items which are included in it. So it does give that sense of space that we wanted to offer to students off campus. So in the virtual gallery, there are seven primary sources that you can click into and each offers a different insight into perceptions of Peterloo and the context of events. In this space, the sources consist of one image and are supported by brief text and an audio commentary from the curators, which we have enabled today. We had hoped to embed more images and some video resources, but unfortunately we couldn't do this in Google Expeditions. So students can explore the virtual space. Uh, they can look at the items uh, that are available in more detail and start to consider differing viewpoints. So the items include the satirical poem, The House That Jack Built, which you just saw, illustrated by George Cruikshank the congratulatory letter sent to the magistrates by the Home Secretary following the event of the day, which you can see here. And you can see the quote about the great satisfaction derived by His Royal Highness from their prompt, um, effective and efficient measures for the preservation of public tranquility. And finally, that we've got to show you here, the printed record of the injured from Peterloo, which includes the names of those injured, their age, their occupation, um, their trade, and the details of the injuries which they sustained. So once the students have finished exploring the sources made available in the virtual gallery, they're assigned a particular item to look at in more detail so that they can answer that question, which we mentioned earlier. So it could be any one of these seven resources that we've made available in the digital space. So the students then explore the particular item in more detail in Manchester Digital Collections, where there is contextual metadata, and very high resolution images to allow a close up interrogation of the sources, which you can see here. So this example is the Peterloo Relief Fund book from 1820, which contains names and injuries of ordinary people from Peterloo and the amount that they received in compensation from voluntary donations. So that shows you a bit of what we were trying to do with the session. After exploring their assigned source in more detail in uh, Manchester Digital Collections, students answer the questions uh, by summarising their findings with the group in their virtual learning environment. And they have to provide evidence as to why they believe Peterloo was a massacre or a riot. Students are then given time to consider how others answer the question and respond to those thoughts and also have an opportunity to look at some of the other sources which they weren't assigned. And then they can report back on whether their views have changed in the light of their discussion and exploration. We conclude the exercise by emphasizing the importance of considering different viewpoints, which led to the creation of different sources, such as those the students have explored. While today Peterloo is considered a massacre, at the time many people portrayed it as a riot in order to justify the action taken by the military and by the magistrates. 
Students are reminded that they should consider the reasons for depicting events in different ways when looking at information sources, whether these are historical or modern. So the intention with our original premise was that this session would achieve the goals of overcoming the barriers that we outlined earlier. So through these exercises, we enable distance learning students to fully participate in a special collection session to develop critical thinking skills. And alongside this, students learn how to access and to handle physical primary sources such as special collections as a result of the session. So it's also intended to increase awareness and confidence to overcome some of those psychological barriers as part of the students' learning. So now that we've walked you through the original session that we created, we want to, we want to consider how the pandemic has impacted on the development of our plans. So we did have um, a number of specific challenges um, at the time when we've originally started the project and obviously subsequently as well. So at the time, pre-pandemic, we faced various challenges, all of which have become even more relevant in the last 18 months. So time, which was always a factor, um, working on, we worked on this project alongside our day job and that, that's always been a challenge. Um, since spring 2020, however, like everyone else in higher education, we've had a lot more pressures on our work time including realigning our priorities and those of our IT colleagues um, who were actually helping and supporting our project. So uh, initially we chose Google Expeditions because it was free, it was easy to use and offered much of the functionality we needed. So however, during the course of the project, Expeditions was upgraded and we were no longer able to use some of the elements, for example, embedding video and other digital objects into the scene. And, and, and Jane mentioned that, that we, we couldn't uh, do that um, at the time, you know, with the higher resolution things that we wanted to do. But since then, the presentation end of um, Expeditions, which is called Poly, has also been turned off and is no, no longer available. We still have the assets we created, which we've shown you today, which we, we've managed to, to keep and capture. Um, and we, and, but there's no longer a user interface for that, for that end, the, the poly area. Um, so we don't have that anymore um, available. Um, Pre-pandemic, we used a range of digital systems to support learning. So our VLE, Manchester Digital Collections, so, uh, quiz software. It was a challenge to plan the students' route through the different platforms since we weren't able um, to embed directly in expeditions um, and obviously that came, came to us after we'd already decided on what we were using um, so we couldn't add the high quality images or that turning the pages. Um, since the pandemic, um, staff at the University of Manchester have started to use a whole new range of digital tools to support teaching and this has helped us to experiment but also meant the students having to familiarise themselves with a range of new technologies which at times has also been challenging. So in addition, physical access to collections um, was, was challenging to enable the creation of online sessions such as this. Um, we were unable to undertake any digitization between March and July in 2020. And we were unable to restart photography uh, due to social distancing. And it was at a lower rate than pre-pandemic when we did. And understandably, there was a much higher demand then. So beyond our specific challenges, um, as we return to this project now over the last 18 months, we've discovered that the landscape of teaching has fundamentally changed. And now so everyone is a distance learner. So with most students now learning online, many at significant distance to their home institutions, the situation has changed dramatically from when we first came up with this project back in 2018. And so rather than investing in exploratory technologies, the sector has largely um, been simply focused on getting students and services online just to continue education with minimal disruption. And what was previously an ordinary sort of day-to-day -day work has become even a bigger challenge. So although we were able to develop a prototype VR model with one of our library developer colleagues, which integrated the virtual reading room with Manchester Digital Collections and the video, we discovered though that the bandwidth required to sustain it would be too much just for the average learner at home. So with everyone effectively a distance learner, the one small investment required for this project, for example, providing Google Glasses for cohorts would now just not be viable. On the other hand, however, though, the parity of access um, to ones like learners has not been so much of an issue as basically no one's had been able to access special collections in taught classes since March 2020. Um, and as a result, many tutors have had to rewrite their courses or had courses cancelled due to the pandemic. And often special collections, um, as many people know, has been the first aspect to be lost, seen as a nice to have or too difficult to arrange when tutors are already grappling with new technologies and new ways of supporting students. 
Finally, AR and VR development for education has also taken a bit of a backseat since the pandemic, with Google announcing that due to issues around access and equity, they no longer support standalone expeditions VR for education, as they now seek to provide basic access to educational resources. So in this sort of post-pandemic world, AR and VR in educational settings now seems a rather indulgent um, and essential access to resources seems more, far more important. Of course, three years in technology terms is a long time, um, but in the last three years, we've also revolutionised, it's revolutionised universities, teaching and special collections worldwide. So with all of that change, we wanted to do a bit of reflection on, um, on what we've been doing. And with the AR and VR aspects of this project now in doubt, we still think that it has been um, significantly valuable to look into these areas uh, to show us how we can develop and enhance special collections teaching with technology. So the pedagogical requirements for distance learners are even more important in the new world of potentially majority distance or non-classroom learners. We continue to seek ways to be student focused, encouraging students to explore and discuss concepts, forming a community, which is vital when classes can't meet in person. And so this kind of follows up that constructivist learning model we were talking about earlier and Fowler's conceptualization, construction and dialogue. Alongside this, the need to be able to access learning anywhere at any time and in any size is increasingly important for truly accessible learning. However, the positive experiential aspects of VR, which were highlighted by Burton Cowling, have actually become less equitable when students are experiencing everything virtually on screen all the time at the moment. Over the last year, as I'm sure you found, we have quickly learned that students want more variety and they want to engage in real collaboration and discussion. So at Manchester, like in many other special collections, we've been developing new and innovative ways to teach students with special collections over the last 18 months using a range of tools and technologies. Building on the learning from this AR VR project that we're showing you today and using constructivist models, we've explored the use of low as well as high tech tools such as blogs and YouTube videos rather than the high bandwidth tech heavy solutions such as AR and VR. One key success has been the use of the open blogging platform Medium to curate packages of materials for teaching, including topics such as handling materials or exploring issues of diversity in archives. And you can see the, the image here is of our homepage on Medium. These have been very well received by tutors and learners at different levels, and they prove valuable in breaking down barriers to awareness and access. We've also continued to look at how technology can support learning rather than simply following new technology. And the pandemic has given us the opportunity to try out different solutions at quite a fast pace. So while tutors have been grappling with the pedagogical challenges of distance learning, we've, we have enhanced existing technological solutions to break down barriers to collections during lockdown. Thanks to an investment in equipment and uh, some colleagues who've done an amazing job working really hard to get all the stuff together um, for a virtual teaching suite, which includes visual visualizers, high quality lights, a mixing deck and various different kinds of cameras. We've been able to continue collections based seminars via Zoom with live collaboration between tutor and curator and student participation. And this has helped us address some of those barriers that um, we mentioned earlier around the physical and psychological um, access to collections, which coincidentally really increase students' confidence and understanding of materials, even though they have been learning from a distance. Crucially, alongside the virtual teaching suite, we um, have been supporting this with full digitization of key items made openly available through Manchester Digital Collections. So this provides learners with high resolution IIIF reproductions of collections with enhanced metadata, and they can explore this outside of scheduled class time following their own interests. And it also supports asynchronous learning and discovery. You can see here the links to the Medium blogging site, um, Manchester Digital Collections, and our Sketchfab account at the bottom. For our MA History of the Book course, which is normally taught entirely on the collections, our fabulous photographers uh, created 3D versions of physical binding module models, which in turn have been created by our conservators, to allow students to engage and interact with virtual bindings in a way which might not even have been possible if they'd have been physically in the classroom. So bringing together existing technologies, along with the broader understanding of best practice that we now have for um, pedagogy in distance learning, it's actually enhanced our teaching with special collections, breaking down those barriers of distance, physical access and interaction, which we had identified for a small cohort in 2018. 
So in conclusion, whilst our project to explore AR and VR aspects of teaching with special collections has stalled over the eight, last 18 months, the post-pandemic reality has led us towards a more nuanced view of how different low-tech solutions combined with the right pedagogy can enhance our teaching without becoming tech heavy. Post-pandemic AR and VR seems less viable solutions for teaching with special collections due to the significant improvements in other technologies, our embracing of distance learning pedagogies and the reality of distance, the distance learning experiences among students. However, we do continue to explore appropriate technologies which can support teaching with special collections, following best practice pedagogies to inform technical solutions, which will no doubt change and develop further over the next 18 months. Um, we'd just like to show our thanks to a number of colle colleagues who have developed some of our new ways of teaching um, during the pandemic and their names are on the screen today as well. Um, we've got a list of references on the next slide as well uh, for the pedagogy that we mentioned earlier and we'd be very interested to hear your experience of using technology um, in teaching with special collections and how the last 18 months has changed your approaches to pedagogy. And um, We'd like to thank you for listening and we're open to any questions. Well, thank you uh, both very much uh, for that, um, which was uh, extremely interesting and um, must have been sort of, uh, as with so many things in the last two years, um, uh, horrendously difficult <laughs> trying to keep up with um, all these sort of constant changes, particularly when, uh, particularly unfair really, when you were sort of ahead of the game anyway, um, and then um, obviously sort of rug kept being uh, pulled out from underneath you. Um, we've got uh, a question from Anne uh, Smets. Um, do you want to um, uh, ask that question? Let me just unmute you okay. if I can. Yeah, but I think uh, uh, I was a bit early with my question because I asked that given the challenges you mentioned, uh, like functionality so it doesn't work anymore, uh, would you still recommend expeditions? No, but I think I got the answer uh, at the end of the presentation. And I, I think you use other resources now, so it was a bit too early. Yeah. Well, but basically they're not developing it any further really because they're concentrating, you know, on just providing general educational access rather than the, the you know, the more enhanced types like VR uh, and AR. So yeah, I probably wouldn't recommend it now. <laughs> okay, thanks. And we have a uh, question from um, Bob. Well, it's me again. Um, <laughs> I find that absolutely fascinating uh, how just the, the, the events, the recent events have completely turned you round in terms of how you see AR and VR. I mean, <clears throat> you used the, the term indulgent, which I thought was quite damning, really, quite a strong way to describe it. Uh, and I'm wondering, I think about it, so I can understand that, you know, the co costs of change, all the different models mean that you can't go down that road anymore. But notwithstanding those, are, are there, is there something, is there anything about AR or VR that you think can offer something that the other low tech models can't? Is there, you know, is there, are there any redeeming features at all or is it just a... Jane, can, can I just go first with that? Okay. So the... the, the the reason I used and we use the word indulgent is because of because of what happened last year and many, many, many of our students just didn't have access to basic IT, uh, basic, you know, basic connections even. So it's, to be able to to do that and have VR and AR um, as a as a standard form of teaching, we just it, it feels indulgent because there's so many people with that, you know, that sort of um internet poverty that don't have that so th that's why it's just felt indulgent i mean i do think if we, you know like you say um notwithstanding if that if there was if it was sort of a free reign that everybody had access i think the ar and vr are, are brilliant tools um to engage students and engage people with the collections and uh, from a distance so it, for me personally jay might have a different take on it but for me that that's that's the main the main reason really i mean we loved doing the project and we loved we loved um being able to discover how we could bring the collections to people who were off campus and we and at the time it wasn't just people who were overseas it was people who were literally just down at main library not at john rylands <laughs> um and that was the, the, that you know our whole idea in, in, initially but um obviously the events of the last 18 months have, have changed everything quite quite significantly basically turned it all upside down so 
I'll let Jane answer if she has. Thank you. Answer. No, I think I think I'd agree with Pavra, and, and yeah, as you explained, a really good reason why we said indulgent, and um, I think it's that equity of access. Having said that, I think um, AR and VR can still be really good tools. I think the key thing, though, um, which sort of reflecting on it, I think we struggle with is the need to have really good tech support, and I think um, if it's part of a streamlined process where you've got, you know, material embedded in a space and you can use your headset and you can go around and you can really interact with things. I think that would work really well. Um, and potentially it might be uh, more of a kind of on campus, but off site so that we could provide the tech to people that they could actually do it with. Um, I think one of the challenges is around trying to build all these things together because it turned out what we were trying to do was actually quite complicated to try and have all these different sort of things in one space. So I think if you could develop it as a streamlined tool, it would be really valuable and really get people into it. But I think it does also depend on what you're trying to do. And I think because ours is quite a structured session, um, there were other ways we could do it. Whereas I've seen others which are much, much less structured and maybe don't have quite the same um, concrete learning outcomes where you just want people to interact and engage. And I think maybe that could be where AR and VR can really um, bring value. Um, we also had a lot of debates with various colleagues about what exactly does AR and VR, what do they mean? And does this count and all that kind of thing? Um, so there was a whole load of debate there as well, but yeah. And just to say, I can see that um, Jill or Gil has put something in about the, the GoPro, um, which we, we've used the GoPro as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it's fantastic particularly for sort of taking people around a building and, and showing areas that you can't normally see, uh, which I think is, is really good and that, that level of participation. So in a way, putting the people back into the technology has, has really been valuable, I think we found. Do you think that um, the the library tours and, and, and the, the making the um, uh, collections more uh, open actually has, has a, also a sort of much wider escape it's sort of way beyond your students in terms of sort of demystifying uh university and, and academia for people who who might not have even thought about it yeah so i take this one first papa yeah <laughs> yes mm -hmm. i i think that's a really key thing um and I imagine like most other HE institutions in the last 18 months, a lot of effort has been put onto our students because, you know, they're, they're having a really difficult time. But I'm personally am really keen on, on sharing our material more broadly. So that, you know, includes the medium blogs that we put out there, which include very basic things on what is special collections? How do you handle material? Our conservators have done some really, really good um, blogs on there about different types of material. And interesting, we've actually had some... Um, some kind of feedback from schools and things about how useful it is and could they have something dedicated to this. Um, so I think it does have that kind of um, promotional almost aspect. I think one of the nice things would be to get more of a dialogue going as well because often it's quite broadcast and we do put as much out there openly as we can um, but it is quite broadcast so yeah I think getting some more feedback would be good. I don't know Padma whether you want to say anything about the concept of MLE and, and how we use that to engage yeah. people. Yeah so um at the University of Manchester, we um, have a programme called My Learning Essentials, and it's to support students, um, obviously, at the university. But we also have a policy of open as well. So all our resources are available to any student. You don't have to be a University of Manchester student. They're available openly, and we have a lot of access to um, our resources from overseas. So people who are studying with somebody else some in the UK or in another country. So a lot of our... Um, a lot of our, our output um, is open by default. So again, yeah, encouraging um, the community, particularly around us in Manchester as well, to, to engage uh, with the collections at John Rylands and schools as well. We have a lot of school um, interaction, but again, the, the ability to have use blogs and have that available um, for anybody to use at any time is, is really valuable. And I think Jane's right. I think having a dialogue, a, a bit more of a dialogue would, would be really, really, really great. Um, but we've all, what we have found with the, the blogs as well is that students who don't necessarily need to use Special Collections and the John Rounds Institute um, for their studies have found it and actually have enjoyed it and, and, and use it. And, um, you know, that again is that reaching a whole new audience that we might not have reached before. So, um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, and I see um, Helen had a sort of uh, related uh, comment, but I, I, I think probably your answers to that have, have uh, answered um, Helen's uh, point as well. Um, 
does anyone have any other uh, questions or um, points they want to discuss? Right, so, um, oh, hello, yes, what's this? So we've got um, a, a question there from uh, Jackie. So do you want to, so do you um, want to uh, unmute yourself? You want me to pop up, do you? Okay, I'll pop up. So what? Um, those of you who work in the wonderful world of HE don't have, that I do have. So I have to work to the highest possible standards of cyber security. So it even means <laughs> that even with the digital collections, an awful lot of ports are cut down and really limited. Um, so that any, any hyperlink that goes back to the main website is strictly controlled. And even I don't have access to them. I can go in and edit a WordPress site but I don't have any access to the wider control of the WordPress site itself. And that's limited to um, two people at Max Communications and involved by lots of extra security licenses. So I wonder if anybody else has these sorts of problems. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. I'd be really interested if other people like to start typing or, or to come in. And I think <laughs> as you say, for HE, I, I guess we, we are expected to be open. Um, the one downside, of course, is that there may be things people want to teach on, courses people want to do that we can't because we can't digitise that material because it's in copyright. And copyright and yeah. intellectual property are really the only the only two major things that stop us from digitising and making things available normally. Um, and yeah, we haven't really got onto our digital collections yet. Digitised, yes, but our digital modern collections, yeah, we haven't really gone there. We're just trying to preserve them at the moment. And I think, you know, for me, uh, providing access to the collections virtually would be a way of overcoming limitations to physical access, because I've got to do it through routes that then meet the NCSC requirements. So that nothing, you know, it is, it, it, I think it's over top. <laughs> But they're very worried about the website getting hacked and something inappropriate being put on the website. Or I think in the past, what happened was um, some malware got installed on one member of staff's computer. So anything you know, sensitive was publicly available. Should it, you know, it's just it's just those little things like that. You know, the things that you don't necessarily think about because say at work, I can't even open. I, lots of professional information is on open access WordPress sites. So I have to always access those through my home, my Gmail. I can never access them through work. So it's just little things like that. And I just wondered, it, just curious, it wasn't particular to my circumstance, but I just wondered if anybody ever came up with any workarounds, I would really love to hear about it. just off the top of my head one thing that might work is if you can get an external commercial company involved um, and your workplace would agree to have things digitized and they could host it at least then it will be out there but it doesn't really solve your problem does it well that that's why i'm working with max communications but even with even with the library catalog it's with it's eos Cersei dynix i have to buy extra and although that's used by us government i've bought the extra security licenses on top of it just to make sure yeah. Anyway, getting there. <laughs> right. Well, and it must be a, a, a relief to know that you're even more secure than the US government. So that's uh, all to the good. Um, I think that looks like unless uh, anybody. Oh, yes, Bob's uh, Bob's waving. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Hi again. Um, so it was just really both what Jackie was saying there and uh, in your presentation, you touched on this as well, or, or was it possibly in the answer to one of the questions, the, the need for tech support for a lot of this sort of thing. And, and that's one of the increasingly 
for a large number of the areas of work in, in archives and special collections is the need for um, uh, tech skills. And I'm just wondering if that's something you wanted to talk a little bit more about, if you see uh, more generally, it can maybe feed into the I assume Bob isn't coming back. Okay, I'll just start answering. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good point. And we're really lucky at Manchester because we have a team of library developers. Um, and we also have, so my colleagues in the photography team are brilliant and they have a lot of skills and we have conservators. So we, we're really lucky that we're quite well resourced. Um, I think the challenge, particularly, we did get our library developers involved. Um, but they very much felt, they, they rather felt that this was indulgent over the, the last year. Um, and we have in the past, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, struggled to get um, much support from other tech teams in special collections. And I think um, it's a lot of it is about, it's kind of even going back behind the, the, the lack of tech support and it's about proving what you can do with a bit of tech support and that strategic steer at the top to, to prove that you are valuable and I think that's something that we're really getting um, at the Rylands Research Institute and Library now which is great um, so I think we'll be able to do more of that but obviously it's got to um, balance out with everything else that the library is trying to do so I suppose there is that that element um, but I would say that I think we're quite lucky in our staffing but also lucky that people are so they, people are interested in working with special collections so as I'm sure many of you have found out it's just about piquing that interest and then getting them in and not letting them leave you know locking the door behind them so they can't escape until they've done what you want them to. Don't have you had anything to add Papa? Nope <laughs> that's that's basically what we did. <laughs> um, yeah people were very happy to get on board weren't they and um, like say one of our library developers they were interested in it um, and literally just before the pandemic struck we'd, we'd only had a meeting about a week before about how we could develop it and what they could do and like how they could develop something a prototype and then then we didn't see them for about a year um just because they were obviously um very busy themselves and trying to support other things so yeah but um yeah initially they, 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 they they're very interested in it and uh, like jane said just trying to get people involved and then shut the door behind them don't let them out <laughs> No IT professionals were harmed in the making of this project, honest. Right. Well, um, uh, we seem to have uh, permanently lost Bob now. The line to Glasgow has obviously been <laughs> complete. There's somebody in an exchange somewhere getting our plugs muddled up, I suspect. Perhaps that's not how the internet works. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, Jane and Padma, that was um, a, a really great presentation. Thank you both very much. Raised up uh, lots of really interesting uh, issues uh, and questions. And um, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, so we've now come uh, to the end of uh, day one of the conference. Um, and um, thank you to all today's speakers. We just had um, a whole succession of extremely interesting and thought provoking um presentations it's been absolutely great um and um there'll be uh, lots of thanks to christine and, and bob for uh, organizing this tomorrow at the end of the conference but um at this point let's just say it's been an absolutely super uh first first day so um thank you to all involved um, and um, I encourage everybody to um, tune in again uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. And again, there's a lot of uh, interesting issues that will be explored, um, picking up on some of the things that have been discussed today and looking at other issues as well. Um, and there's, uh, just to uh, start off, we've got um, a succession of presentations on uh, there's a case study of environmental control at the University of Glasgow. Um, there's uh, a, a, a look at the rationalising ethical sampling for scientific research um, and picking up something that uh, uh, was discussed in the first session, um, a uh, discussion of uh, microfading. Um, so a huge amount uh, of stuff tomorrow. Um, so I um, hope to see you all again then. Thank you.